This episode was brought to you by Resilient Nutrition. Pals. Pals, greetings, greetings, and welcome to another episode of Everything Endurance. It is, as always, wonderful to have you with us today. Um, well, it's been a busy month, hasn't it? May has been a busy month. It, it hasn't been the month that we wanted here in the UK in terms of weather. Um, you know, we're supposed to be seeing something that looks a bit like summertime, and we get the odd flash of it, but that's between drudge and greyness and howling wind and hailstorms and pouring rain as anyone who has been out on uh, on some monstrously long runs lately will attest to and i'm talking you sabrina Virgies and tom hollins who've had very very windy rain soaked um wainwright attempts um and of course john kelly and damian hall who've uh, been out setting records in the last couple of weeks and being buffeted and battered around in the mud um but you know i'm looking out my window now and there are the first shiny signs that we might be getting something resembling summer coming along and as i've just mentioned there are records out there getting broken there are people out there attempting things again it's starting to feel exciting so yeah watch this space we should have some really interesting interviews coming up over the next few weeks if people are gonna keep being out there doing these wonderful things i'm gonna keep bugging them afterwards on your behalf um uh, on the business side of things um we've just confirmed who all the speakers are going to be on the highland ultra um so there's going to be speakers and workshops in all the evenings at the end of each day so if you don't know what the highland ultra is then you haven't been paying attention for the last few episodes it's a 125 kilometer three-day race on the noidart peninsula which is basically the Scottish equivalent of Middle Earth. Um, absolutely, stunningly, wonderfully beautiful place. Um, and we're going to be taking people up there in October, and there will be... Uh, have a look on the website, um, www.beyondtheultimate.com, and you'll see. You'll find the whole Highland Ultra on there, and you'll find a couple of articles where we introduce all the speakers. And anyone who's attending is in for a fireside treat each evening, is is what I can tell you confidently. So go and have a look for the Highland Ultra. I, I wholly recommend that you do so. Um, I've got a pretty busy episode. Pretty busy episode today. Not Not just one guest. Oh, no. Oh, no. But two. Two for you lucky people. Um... First of all, I'm going to be talking to someone who's just broken the uh, record. I'm, I'm leaning towards record now rather than FKT. I, I didn't want to have to pick a side in this argument, and I, I, I'd love to not have to at all, but I have to say one word or the other, and FKT seems to have become a little bit controversial in the UK ultra running scene for some reason. Um, so let's say record. Uh, we're going to be talking to someone today who broke a record for the Pennine Way last year that had stood for 31 years, only to see it broken again by Damien Hall just over a week later. But here we are a year down the line, and he's done it again and taken a pretty monstrous bite out of the record that was set just last summer. Um, obviously, we're going to be talking to the absolutely amazing John Kelly, who's now also again again a repeated record broken here um is once again the athlete who has spent the most time talking to me on this podcast so um yeah um you're going to enjoy the interview with him i'm absolutely certain and once again thank you to john kelly for allowing me to stalk him over the last couple of years um after that i've tagged on another interview with a good friend of mine dr nikki ligo who has been out there working alongside these athletes and supporting these record attempts over the last couple of years and you will scarcely find somebody who knows their way up and down the Pennine Way in anywhere near the detail that this woman does you you will scarcely find someone willing to put more of their self and their energy into looking after other people and helping them achieve what they want to achieve and she's going to give us a little window into what goes on behind the scenes in these monstrously long record attempts um and yeah, I think you're really going to enjoy that as well. There's some really interesting stuff. I appear to have waffled enough. I think we're now ready to actually hear an interview. So without further ado, I will introduce, uh, introduce, I will introduce John Kelly. John, how are you doing? Doing all right. How are you doing? 
oh, well, not too bad. Thank you very much for asking. Um, I have to say, I haven't really done anything more strenuous than hanging around on this sofa since the last time we spoke. Uh, you, however, have put yourself through a lot more strain than that. Uh, massive congratulations on uh, grabbing the pen I'm way FKT again. Thanks very much. No yeah, worries. It was uh, quite the, the fun adventure out there last week. I Quite the fun adventure. <laughs> Well, t- type type two fun uh, at least. Well, yeah. a- actual fun for about you know two thirds of it. Um, the the last third definitely more uh, type two fun. Ah, uh, man, I bet I I was watching you on the tracker, and of course I'm I'm in Sheffield, so I'm not too far away from the bottom of the Pennine Way anyway. And I was watching you flying along on that tracker, and it is I uh, congratulations again. You were moving so so quickly. And then I, I just saw the weather outside of my window and had a look at the forecasts, and I, I felt for you, man. I really did. You, you hit some tough conditions again on the Pennine Way. Do you, do you have no luck with weather? Not, not so far. Uh, but you know, I've certainly had it worse. There, there, there were some muddy and boggy s- stretches that were, were tough to deal with, and and, and slow going. The, the weather that rolled in, though, uh, it, it was cold. Uh, it was, it was rainy. There was some hail. Um, and, and you know, that, that requires taking on an off kit, layering on some extra weight. Uh, so it, it slows you down a bit, but I, I was glad there wasn't a, a strong wind with it, uh, particularly not a headwind. I was worried about that going North to South. Uh, so it, it certainly could have been worse and, and, you know, maybe the cold and the hail in my face just helped keep me awake a, a little bit on that last stretch. <laughs> Well, there you go. Uh, we can say then that the hail was working in your favour, I suppose. Um, we're, we're already on the trail at this point in the conversation. Let's let's just back up a little bit. When I I had no idea this um, next attempt was coming, so you you did really well at sort of keeping it quiet. When when did you decide you were this was it? I'm heading out fifteenth of May. We're gonna we're gonna have another way, uh, go at the Pennine Way. Oh, so I'd I'd had it kind of on on my calendar all year and. It- I had, I, I was pretty certain uh, I was, I was going to go back and do it even before I finished uh, my run last year. And, and people will assume I, I just went back to, to get the record back. And, and yeah, that's, that's part of it. Um, but it, it, it wasn't long into my run last year that it was clear to me uh, that I, I was having some issues that were going to keep me from really putting down my, my best performance. And so on something like this, it's, it's one of those challenges and goals that I've, I've put some, uh, a lot of myself into and, and have some personal meaning attached to. And, and for those, I, I want to go out there and, and know that I've done my best. And if that's, if that's the record, uh, that's, that's great. Um, but it, you know, if not, then that, that's that's all I, I can ask for is is having my my best effort out there and, and leaving my mark on it. Well, you've you've said a couple of times before that the thing you're really looking for when you go out and take on these challenges is is seeing where the end of your limits are. You know, is seeing how far you can push yourself. I guess your attempt last year, there were a couple of factors going against you, and you weren't able to get a true test of quite what you could do out on the Pennine Way. Do you do you feel like you've scratched that itch this time, or do you still feel like there's areas you could shave even more time off? Yeah, so as I do as an overly analytical person, I've, I've of course spent a good chunk of the last week kind of picking things apart and looking at where I, I could have uh, picked up more time. And, and there are certainly a, a few things that I, I could have done better um, and, and shaved off some time here and there. Uh, but, it, you know, it, as long and as complex as these things are and as many variables as there are uh, going out there and expecting everything to go perfectly. Uh, you know, that's, that's buying a lottery ticket. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost never going to happen if I went back out there and fixed the things that I could have done better this time, chances are something else will go wrong that will cost me just as much, if not more time. So it's, it's definitely that, that point of diminishing returns. Um, and you know, I, I think that if I, if I had perfect conditions and the perfect performance, uh, that I, I could probably knock about two more hours off of it, do, do something around 56. But again, like that's, that just, 
th that doesn't happen uh, for, for these sorts of things. And that's part of what makes them so fun and, and so interesting. Well, yeah, in 40 years of living in the UK, I can't remember 56 hours of consistent weather. So you're, you're, you're definitely asking for the impossible there. But you must be at the point now of marginal gains being what would speed you up, you know, pot noodle lids that would come off faster or something yeah. along those lines. Yeah, I, I mean, there, there was one one stop in particular um, in, in Gargrave. And so things, things went really well um for about the first 200 miles uh and, and malum tarn uh as the second night started uh, i was i was even kind of joking with my support crew that they were giving me the the weather forecast for edale uh the, the following evening they said oh it's, it's gonna be nice and email e edale tomorrow evening and i said well what what about tomorrow afternoon and you know i was i was moving well i, I felt good and it but it wasn't very long after that. Malum, Malum Tarn has 70-ish miles, 75 miles till Edale. Um, and not long after that, I, I, I really started having trouble uh, staying awake, uh, started having a bit of trouble keeping food down. Uh, and so I, I stopped and uh, my pace started deteriorating a bit. And so I stopped in Gargrave for a nap. Uh, aiming for about 20 minutes, woke up after about 10 minutes and was shivering um, pretty uncontrollably, was was cold. And, and so stuck around there um, for a bit to warm back up, um, kind of reset my, my body a, a bit. And I did move better coming out of there. Um, but all in all, I, I was probably at Gargaray for 40 minutes or so. And, um, you know, I, I probably should have just suited up and, and warmed back up on, on the move and, and saved about 20 minutes there. So there are always things like that. Um, but, you know, there's also a chance that if I had tried to do that, then I, I would have I would have gone over the edge and imploded and, and crashed and burned entirely. Uh, so it's I, I don't think you all have the, the prices right here in the UK, but, you, you know, you, you're trying to guess the price as close as possible. But if you go over by, by even a, a cent, you, you lose. And so it's, it's very much like that. You're trying to push yourself to your, to your absolute limit without going over because the second you go over, things can just fall apart uh, entirely. Yeah. God, absolutely. But um, I'm moving us back up the course again a little bit what you ran north to south this time was was there a particular reason you decided to do it this way around uh getting the sheviots and crossfell out of the way early were, was really appealing to me uh the sheviots is, is really the the toughest section uh yeah. of it um as as far as uh terrain and, and elevation change and um some some boggy stretches go uh, and then cross fell is, is of course the, the highest point. And so, um, that both of the, the Sheviots are right off the bat. Um, and cross fell is just before a hundred miles when you're going North to South. And the difference uh, is just, uh, you know, I remember last year, uh, the very final part, um, you, you just do a short out and back up to the Sheviot. Uh, before dropping to the finish at Kirk Yeto. And yeah. that little out and back last year at the end of the run in some nasty weather at night, it felt endless. It just absolutely endless. Every little turn I went around, this is, it. this has to be it. It's, it's here. Right. And it, it just, it, it went on and on. And, and this year starting off with that, you know, I, I make a turn and we chat for a little bit. And next thing I know I'm, we're there. And I was like, that was it. <laughs> That's that's it. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's let's turn and keep going. <laughs> that's ideal. That's what you want. And uh, you're right. The Chivi is a tough, tough bit of the country. Like having done the coverage for the Spine Race a few times, I've seen some very strong runners break down as they get into that section in the course. So I, I can see how it makes more sense to do the do the attempt downhill this time around. Yeah, and well, it's it's actually one one interesting. Slight misperception. Edale is slightly higher in elevation than Kirk Yeto. Um and and so it's it's net uphill going going north to south. Damn but it! it I mean, I was definitely it, only joking, but 
yeah, in yeah. my head, I would I would not have guessed it that way around. Yeah, but I mean, definitely once you get up to that Shivia, it's it's a net downhill from from there. Yeah, true enough, true enough. But um, I got to ask them what what was different this time. What what helped you shave those few hours off and get this incredible sub sixty time that you've got? Uh, consistency, uh, I would say. Uh, I had a. Uh, a better plan um you know uh, i was very fortunate to to have nikki ligo as my road support last year for for a number of reasons but um not the least of which is she's a doctor um a a real doctor not a fake engineering one like me (laughs) um and so she she was able to kind of observe what had gone wrong and and diagnose the issue and um so that that really helped uh with some preventative measures uh this year uh, keeping my my gut from going the direction it did last year where i i developed a, a full full-blown ulcer um oh you on, did on their own. I... yeah uh, and so uh, i was you know uh able to, to keep eating pretty consistently uh until the very final stretch this year um, and and just had a, a good schedule uh, in in hand, a, a good uh, pace plan, and and great support who who knew me uh, better from having most of them done it last year as well, and so uh, just just kept moving much more consistently uh, without much uh, of a of a lull in my pace or, or downtime in the middle to fix stomach issues. Fantastic. And I, I, I hadn't realized that's how severe your stomach problems had got last time around. And I don't say that to sort of belittle the stomach problems you've had last time. I've seen some of the dis- disastrous digestive issues that ultra runners can tangle themselves into during during any given race. But you actually got to the point where you caused yourself an ulcer last time along. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was uh, that, that was fair, fairly early on. Um, so it was it was not the pleasant experience for most of that. Uh, and I, I ate fairly well this time. My stomach did start, uh, having issues kind of just on, on the last stretch that the last 50 miles or so. And, you know, whenever you're moving at that intensity for that long, you're going to start having issues. Um, my, my eight month old daughter was really the kind of the MVP at that point as one of the food ideas uh, I got was her, uh, her little baby food pouches or her sachets, I think you say here. Yeah. And it's, it's just pureed fruit, uh, in a, in a little squeeze pouch. And, and so that, that's the majority of what I ate on the move, um, for the last eight, eight to 10 hours, uh, of it. I, one of the things I thought was fascinating after, after this particular attempt was this is the first time really I'd seen like the BBC picked it up. But they really focused on the pot noodle element of this. I, I, I didn't notice the sachets of baby food in their article. They've, they've missed that in their research. Well, yeah, that, that, those were what I ate mainly on the, on the run. Uh, so there aren't as many photos of those. Whereas at, at the, the stops, I was trying to load up on pot noodle and rice pudding. There is a particular photo of you staring at a posh no- uh, pot noodle. I think it's a Steve yeah. Ashworth picture where I, I honestly can't tell. You obviously need the calories, and there's that need in your eyes, but also murder. Like yeah. you, you possibly never want to see a chicken and mushroom pot noodle again. It's it's a very conflicted moment they managed to capture there. Yeah, I, I'm guessing that was at Snake Pass, which is the last road crossing uh, before Edale, where I, I was. Let's just say that was a bit of a low stretch. Um, and you know, my, the, the, the lead pacer, uh, on that part was Marcus Scottney and he, he had on these bright yellow shoes and all I remember for a, a large portion of that was, was fixating my eyes on the bright yellow shoes, just follow the bright yellow shoes, just go wherever they go. And that's kind of all my mind had, had bandwidth for so uh, wow. you know i sat down for a minute at snake pass and they hand me the pot noodle and it's it kind of didn't really know what to do with it <laughs> uh, so there's a half i was reading a lot into that really emotionally there's a decent chance that what i was reading in your eyes there was nothing at all <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's uh, uh well I, I think they're they're both both fairly likely to be honest 
Oh, fair enough. Well, but, thank but God I, for Marcus I, Scotney's footwear. Yeah, and I, I, I can't hate Pot Noodle too much. They've they've pulled me out of some bad moments. So, you know. It was excellent to see it pop up on the BBC, even if it was an article more focused on the food than anything else, though. I, maybe over the last couple of years, you guys have managed to uh, raise the profile enough that, that we're into the mainstream media a little with ultra running now. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, food, food's definitely an important part. You can do well. I mean, you can kind of see the difference it makes in, in part with the uh, six, six and a half hours faster that I ran it this year compared to last year when I, I wasn't eating at all. Uh, uh, so yeah, it's, it's been good. They've, um, they've contacted me and a few other kind of local um, BBC branches have, have contacted me to, to set up uh, wanting to do articles or, or interviews or whatnot. So it's, uh, it's exciting to, to see some more interest in that and, and hopefully it'll bring more interest uh, to uh, places like the Penine Way and, and wilderness areas in, in general is that's uh, really an important part of what we do is, is just bringing attention to the, to the value uh, that, that these places provide. I, I still remember you shared around that um, Laz Lake sort of blog that you put together about being a, a sort of ambassador for the for the wilderness and you're certainly flying the flag high, you know. <laughs> Um, also, it's made things like researching podcasts a lot easier. I remember the first time I spoke to you, as soon as I typed in John Kelly, I got former White House Chief of Staff John Kelly. And now he's still there on the first page of Google, but he's not alone. You you do appear there now. So that, that's pretty I, exciting. I, I do. And I, I must admit that with a name as common as mine, um, it's it, it's been a bit of, of one of my life goals to, to manage to make it somewhere in the... Uh, Google results without clicking through to like the 503rd page. So <laughs> I, I think I am there if you're searching from the UK. Uh, but if you search from the US, then it's it's all still the former chief of staff and a running back for the Cleveland Browns. And I think a, a few other people uh, pop up there first. Yeah, dude, there's still time. <laughs> um, obviously, we've touched on the fact that you were suffering a little from sleeplessness by the end of this, which is entirely understandable. Um, do you have a round figure of how much you did manage to sleep during this attempt? Uh, I think Nikki said 22 minutes, which seems oddly specific to me. Uh, I've been saying 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was it, it was that first nap at Gargrave where I woke up from the cold uh, after about 10 minutes. And, and then not too long after that, uh, I, I went down for another quick nap uh, at Cowling, which that one was much more efficient uh where i you know i basically went down for 10 minutes and popped back up and and got moving and is that something you decided to do how does that compare with the amount of sleep you had on your last attempt uh well the last attempt uh, i was i was really trying to do a lot to to sort of reset my body and reset my stomach and, and kill two birds with one stone by getting some sleep uh, i hoped that by going down for some legitimate sleep that maybe my stomach would reset, I'd be able to eat again, and at the same time, I'd get the benefits that sleep bring. Um, so going into both of them, my goal was to kind of not sleep at all, uh, to, to only sleep when necessary. And it turns out that last year it was just much more necessary uh, because of the issues I was having and also because calorie depletion can cause you to become more tired. A lot of people think that if you get sleepy, you need to, to pop some caffeine, which that can certainly help, but also eat, freaking eat some food, get some calories in, um, and, and that'll, that'll help. Uh, and so th this year it was, it was much the same where I, I didn't, I didn't want to sleep. 60 hours is kind of right on that threshold for me, where it's like, you know, maybe I can make it there without sleeping. Um, and so it, it to me it, it comes down to a matter of when I get to the state where I'm just kind of stumbling around and I'm I'm having trouble keeping my eyes open and I could literally if I closed my eyes for two seconds I would fall asleep while moving and just fall over on the side of the trail and so when I get to that point a, a quick ten minutes or so is, is a huge mental refresh um, and in particular I know that there are certain times of day where my circadian rhythms at kind of its low point and if i can just do something to get through that stretch that time window then i'll be good 
Um, and so at, at those points, that's when I do say, okay, I, I need to t- 10 minutes, even if it's on the side of the trail, we'll get refreshed and I'll, I'll keep moving. And I, I do pop out of those moving better, but it's, it's a fine line to walk. Cause I mean, you, you think if, if, if you go down for 10 minutes, you have to run the next 10 miles at a minute faster per mile to, to make up that time. And so it's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. Uh, to do that sometimes maths will keep you awake at night oh well you are i mean you and other athletes who are taking on this kind of thing are are really at the edge of what we know about how long you can keep going like this without sleep so you're you're sort of at the cutting edge of sleeplessness research here at the moment Do, do you feel like you've got to the edge of what you can do there can you prepare yourself for these very extended periods of sleeplessness while you're while you're training and preparing for this sort of challenge um everyone everyone responds to sleeplessness a, a bit different and everyone responds to, to sleeping a bit differently as well um so i mean that's why sleep strategies as far as whether it's best to take a few power naps or best to take one longer sleep and and when you do it how long into the run you do it these are things that people kind of have to learn for themselves uh to an extent and so i I still have this issue where i i i feel is a bit unique to me where again i i can just fall asleep while moving um it's it's kind of ultra ultra running induced narcolepsy Whereas a lot of people I feel like are better at pushing through that, but then they start getting hallucinations and all sorts of other things that I've, I've never had. I've never had a a, a legit hallucination. I've had like, Oh, that tree looks like a person um, out of the corner of my eye, but nothing that's, you know, full on hallucination. Um, So, yeah, I, I feel I'm, I'm a kind of at the edge of, of what I can do on that. It's not something that I feel like you can, get better at in in terms of um not getting sleepy um but i I think you can get better at in terms of how you respond to it uh how you you mitigate that and and what your your strategy is uh, to be able to keep moving forward when that that sleepiness does hit you Uh, sleeplessness is obviously not something that's going to help you while you're training as well you need that sort of good recovery time between sessions and sleep becomes extremely important when you're doing that but while you're preparing for a challenge like this will you will you practice in a way will you you know go out for a long run overnight and deprive yourself of a night of sleep to to try and prepare yourself for it or is is there anything to be gained in that um i've i've you know i i unintentionally get plenty of sleepless nights from from my job and and other things um but as you say you you need that sleep to recover and and generally it's going to go um it's going to do more harm than good if if you're intentionally making that a part of your training Uh, i have done some some overnight sessions um but generally when i've done those it's, it's more about um just learning to 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 navigate at night and um seen mentally how i respond uh to, to nighttime conditions and, and getting a better grip on that uh rather than uh, forcing sleep deprivation on myself fair enough i i, I can quite understand that <laughs> i can't imagine it's something that i'd want to put myself through repeatedly um let's just think when you were getting towards the end of this particular fkt um you mentioned marcus and his magical bright yellow shoes which is uh, we've got to be very thankful for at this point um marcus mentioned that there were even some tears towards the end there i mean psychologically where are you for that last few hours while you're out on the trail uh edale my, my mind's in detail already um, oh, I bet. Tr- trying to be a, a, a bit you know it was it was a huge boost to know that my my family was able to make it up there um and be there at the finish and that's something that it, i don't want to say i intentionally timed but i i knew from the outset that if i finished quick enough um that that my family would be able to be there at the end uh whereas if i i if i were too slow it would be later in the evening and, and they wouldn't be able to, uh, to, to be, be up there that late with the kids. Um, so that was a nice added boost there. 
That's fantastic. But is that what you need to do to get yourself through those particularly dark times? Do you put your mind further down the course? Do you put yourself elsewhere or are you are you where you are, if you get what I mean? Are you are you present in your body or are you just trying to get your mind out of there because that's where all the pain is? Yeah, I mean, generally, I'm pretty fixated on the, the nearest thing that I can be fixated on, whether it's just making it up the, the next hill, um, making it to wherever the yellow shoe just stepped in front of me, um, the next road crossing, whatever. I mean, you've got to break things down like that. Uh, at any point in time, uh, you've, you've got to, um, if you try to conceptualize the entire thing that you have left, it, it's going to be overwhelming. Uh, and, and that's true throughout, uh, when you start the thought of 260 miles is overwhelming. When you've gone 240 miles and you're at that bad of a state, the thought of 20 miles is overwhelming. Um, and so it's it's constant fixation just on the, the next step. And, and eventually you get there. Um, I do try to kind of give myself little extra milestones uh, along the way is, is kind of a nice boost. I'll, I'll kind of start off and say, oh, I'm 10% of the way there, I'm 20% and, and I'm, I'm 30. And then once I get to halfway there, it's, it's, it becomes the game of like, how many times can you fold a piece of paper in half? Of I'm, ha I'm halfway there okay. and now I'm halfway from halfway and now I'm halfway again and, and now I'm halfway again. And then eventually it just gets to like a mile left and it's, it's four laps around the track, just, just four laps around the track I, and, and I'll be there. So, you know, these, these ever decreasing, um, stretches and, and milestones to give yourself as you degrade, uh, is, is critical for me. As you degrade, <laughs> <laughs> you put it very well. Um, how 31 years the Pennine Way FKT stood for before you and Damien Hall decided to start duking it out on the trail. Um, do you see this record standing a little longer than the eight days you got last time? And I, I asked that question well, feeling well, it, myself like this one's got to stand for a while. It, it already has, um, unless someone's um. out there uh, <laughs> who started yesterday that, that I don't know about. Well, I guess by the time um, this podcast comes out, we'll know then. But um, yeah, 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 not so as far as we're aware. Um, but yeah, I, I I feel a, a bit better um, about this one. It's, but you know, who, who knows? Like I said, there's there's time to be had there. There is. Uh, I didn't execute the perfect run. The conditions were by no means perfect, and uh, who's to say I'm the perfect person to be out there in the first place? So. Uh, I, I do think that there is a, a little bit of, of time left, but I also think that we're, we're not going to keep seeing it broken by three hours. Um, it's, it's definitely diminishing returns there. And, and one thing that I was kind of, one thing that I use a lot to, to plan my pace and to look at how I did afterwards is, is comparing um, my run to some of the, the top performances on the track for the same duration, because that's somewhere where you don't have all of these variables like underfoot conditions and all of this other stuff to deal with. So it's kind of, okay, if conditions were perfect, what pace could you run? And so for this one, uh, if, if you, if you include all of my stops to sleep and, and warm up and everything else, Strava has my grade adjusted pace at, at 1140 something um for that 58 hours and then the um the i think the american record for 48 hours on a track is uh, around an 11 minute pace so it's it's, it's starting to get kind of tight there um yeah i, I feel like um but it, you know the, again there's there's still room to, there, there's still time that can be gained by by not stopping uh, as, as much as i did i i reckon i stopped for a about two hours um in, in total some of which is necessary but but some of which you can you can cut out i see what you mean i i can't see it being three hours bitten off this record again but somebody might find an extra five minutes just those faster unwrapping pot noodles or something might just do it for somebody yeah yeah well it's also one of those things where if, if someone if someone breaks it i want them to break it by like an hour at least because otherwise it'll be like ah gargrave <laughs> shouldn't have stopped at gargrave oh man yeah i see what you mean 
You are, I, well, obviously, I don't want anyone to go out and break your record, John, but if they do, I, I hope they give it a good punch in the face. <laughs> yeah, well, w- one day. One day, I hope they do. Um, just, you know, m- not, not today. <laughs> <laughs> well, Damien's distracted anyway. He's off doing something else now, isn't he? He's, yeah, yeah. He's going left to right rather than up and down now. Um, which leads me on. What, what's next for John Kelly? Uh, I've, I've had a, you know... I've tried to be as flexible as I can over the past year and, and planning things that uh, are less likely to get affected by COVID, but also knowing that they might get affected by COVID. Um, and so I've got a few things uh, I'd, I'd like to do a, a few um, plans. I'll, I'll start kind of sorting out and piecing together. Now I was really focused on the Penine way um, until it was done before I started really planning out the next thing. Um, I, I would like to, to give the, the Wainwrights to go at, at some point. Um, I've got a return to Tour de Giant, um, on the books sometime as, as that's another one that I feel I, I didn't give my best performance the first time around. Um, so we'll, we'll see. I, 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 I also wanted this past winter, my plan was to do, um, the, the big three rounds solo unsupported, midwinter um but that's Oof. that's one that that covid uh s- scuttled those plans so we'll yeah. we'll see what we can do yeah we had some seriously seriously tight restrictions across the winter that won't have done you any favors there i i, I had the wayne whites written down as a maybe for you <laughs> if that was something that you might be interested to a bigger distance this time is that is that something that interests you if you've you know beating yourself as thin as you possibly can on the Pennine way. Will you look for something longer next? Uh, it's, it's not necessarily longer. Um, it's, uh, it, well, the, yes, the Wainwrights is longer, but yeah. a, 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 as far as what I'm looking for, isn't necessarily longer. It's, um, a, a different type of challenge. Um, you, you know, Wainwrights has, uh, it's, uh, more freestyle that fell running. Um, there's not a defined trail the way that, that the Penine Way has. Uh, it's, it's a lot more elevation than the Penine Way. Uh, conditions are, are different. And, and so um, it, it's it's fun to, to test myself on, under different conditions and with different variables and, and to see how, um, how I respond to those and, and how I can um, work with those. Uh, I, you know, Wayne Wright's ideally wouldn't be much longer um, than, than my grand round last year so around mm, that, that same time frame any longer than that and, and you you really start to, to run into kind of diminishing returns as, as far as time away from family goes um it's it's hard to take off from work for that long uh you know one day if i <laughs> if i can somehow um be set and, and not not have to work or, or have just a, a huge break um built up then the my holy grail um would would be to to do the appalachian trail uh fkt amazing uh, uh you know that's that's one where the the record right now is is, is carl sabe at, at 42 days uh and and some change and so that's a qu- quite quite a long time to hit the pause button uh on the rest of your life yeah just a little bit uh, there's Christian Morgan, who I interviewed last year, actually. I believe he's about to go out and have, an, uh, have a go at the Appalachian Trail. So who knows? Maybe there'll be another FKT when it when it comes to that. Yeah. <laughs> That's reminded me of something. Where do you stand on the record or FKT argument? And I'm sorry to even bring it up. I, 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 I really don't care. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I respect the traditions here, the, the Penine Way uh has has been around for a while um the the record has been around for longer than the term fkt has existed um but to me it's it's kind of one of those a, a square is a rectangle but a rectangle is not always a square argument um and and that you know a, a record is always an fkt um but an fkt isn't necessarily a, a record the, the very concept of fkt is based on on these these trails and the, the u.s that sometimes you really don't know like you you do it and you put down a fast time and you say well that's the fastest i can find that anyone has ever done it but i i, I don't know and so it's it's a very much a, a literal term uh in in that sense 
uh, whereas something like the benign way, you you know darn well that no one has done it faster. Um, but you know, in that sense, it, it's still both. Um, and and you know, the 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 tradition here has has been record, and and so that's that that's what I, I typically use uh, when referring to it. Oh, fair enough. I'll I'll try and lean that way as well. I've seen some convoluted attempts at it. Uh, there's a report I was reading not too long back that called it a record for the fastest known time for the Pentine Way. And it's like, well, now you've just said it both ways. Like, you're just hedging your bets. Yeah. No. Well, John, thanks for catching up with us again. I really appreciate it. Oh, you know what? I had one last question written on here, and mm -hmm. I, although I've started my conclusion there, I'm going to go back because I'm interested in this. Um you've obviously you've covered an awful lot of miles now you've done some very very big events some really really big challenges do you still learn a lot each time you go out do, did you take a big lesson from this this fkt attempt yeah um sometimes it's it's not always the the same kind of big uh big questions on you know the, the meaning of life or who i am as a person or what my strengths are the, it, it's not that every single time um but uh on anything of this length and complexity there are definitely lessons to take away at least um for the next time in, in terms of you know what what food works best um should i get going uh get moving again to warm up rather than sitting around and and, and gargrave um the, you know the, the, those sorts of things are, are definite takeaways but then there is also um a bit of the just you know what can i focus on uh to keep myself going uh what are the things that i really turn to uh when i'm in those those low moments uh and and that's something that that really needs constant reinforcing um it's it's kind of no matter how time how many times you do it uh, you, you get back out there and you have to remind yourself like yeah i've I've done this before i, I can I can do this again and and each time you do it it, it reinforces itself and 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 it builds you up a bit stronger uh, for the next time whether the next time is running or you know a job at work or, or whatever well wow. well that was a fantastic answer thank you very much I'm glad I went back and put that question in. um but yeah Thank you very much for talking to us again, John. It's greatly appreciated. I'm going to let you get on with the rest of your evening. Um, and once more, just a, a massive congratulations. It was a very pleasurable dot watching experience, if not always a pleasurable experience for you. Well, thanks very much. Yeah, good, glad to hear it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, have a good evening, pal. Thanks, you too. Hi, everyone. Sorry to interrupt. Just here to remind you that this episode was brought to you by Resilient Nutrition, and you can find their full range of Elite Long Range Fuels exclusively on the BTU store now. The Elite Long Range Fuels are a series of delicious nut butter products with micronutrients and supplements designed to give you exactly what you need when you need it. Um, they're delicious, they're great for fueling your whatever your adventure is, and you can find them on the BTU store and nowhere else right now. Store dot beyond the ultimate dot co dot uk store dot beyond the ultimate dot co dot uk okay let's get back to the podcast good morning then nikki lago dr nikki lago good morning how are we doing yeah morning thanks bit tired but but i'm well thanks I, yeah, yeah, I, I bet you're feeling tired this morning. I have to say I'm really grateful for you banging in a couple of coffees and agreeing to talk to me this morning. Could, for the benefit of the people listening in, what what is it that you've been up to for the last few days that's that's got you so tired? So I've been away with um, Damien and his crew, Damien Hall, uh, who's just finished his successful record attempt to run the coast to coast. Um he, he was trying to beat a, a record, another one of Mike Hartley's records um, that stood for the thick end of 30 years. Wow. And, uh, yeah, so he set off at 6 o'clock on Tuesday morning and we kind of leapfrogged him all the way along and he finished uh, 39 hours, 18 minutes and 40 seconds later, taking, I think it was 18 minutes and 12 seconds off the record. And it Which, was in ultra running terms, that's squeaky bum time, right? That's milliseconds over really a distance is, that it far. Really is, yeah, it was. Um, it was a. It was. Let's say it was. It was high drama. 
and almost every one of these things seemed to have some drama somewhere but yeah it, was, it felt quite dramatic the last 30 miles had us all there were swear words and everything <laughs> wow uh, from you and from Damo no oh, actually no I didn't hear him swear no he just went quiet that was even more worrying. oh god that is alarming <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, incredible. I, I mean, as a as a dot watcher, I was obviously watching it from the comfort of my home on the sofa, unfolding on my mobile phone. But um, it, yeah, he seemed to be absolutely flying for a good while, and then there wasn't much smiling anymore. And the dots started to get a bit closer together on the map. It, it, it sounds like it was a tough one. It was. He he's. I mean, he knew he had to he had to move at a, a you know a really fast pace. Um, the the record was a was. I mean, obviously there's. There's a reason it, it's just stood for 30 years. I don't think anyone felt tempted to try it because it was incredibly fast. So he, he did move really quickly. But I think um, I don't think he or we expected things to go quite the way that they did for the last 30 miles. I mean, he was he had really shoddy weather. It was chucking it down for a lot of the time. It was claggy. It was windy and it was cold. I mean, I was wearing you know, every layer I had to stay warm waiting at um, at road crossings. And, you know, he, I mean, he doesn't really mind. He, I think he prefers to run in rain and cooler weather, but um, the underfoot conditions were awful. He was spending, you know, he had hours at a time when he was literally sliding around in the mud. Wow. Um, and, yeah, and then things just, he became really confused. So he came in, this is, I think, something like 30 miles to the end. He came in and... Uh, Jason Cavill was pacing him at the time, was just going to the end of his pacing leg. And he came in and just said, uh, he's a little bit confused. And then Damien wandered in, in what I can only describe as a kind of, you know, four pints type of state. <laughs> he was like, um, he was sort of, yeah, he didn't know he didn't know why he was running. He didn't know where he was heading to. He didn't really seem to know that he was trying to break a record. He knew he had to do something, but he was constantly asking what. It was all a bit of a... You know, we were just saying, just go and run with the nice people. And when they stop, you can stop. <laughs> and, um, yeah, which was a bit disconcerting, really. But uh, And then he started to get this kind of lean. And, uh, I mean, we've seen it before. You know, yeah. most people have seen it before. We've certainly seen it on the spine. Some people refer to it as the Colin Green lean. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> really There's happy. an in-joke for the spiners that are listening to this. Yeah. yeah one, of the, one of the spine spine participants who also came in with that lean. And it's really difficult to know why that happened. I mean, I think it's multifactorial, but it was what it was. It is worrying. You know, he, so you can lean because you're leaning away from pain. And obviously at that point he had pain. You can lean because you're just exhausted but you can lean because and be confused because you're sleep deprived calorie intake but also there's um a, a, just a concern about salt levels so there are um circumstances in ultra running where uh, you can develop a low sodium level a low salt level exercise induced uh, or exercise associated hyponatremia it's called and and that can be a little bit worrying that can happen if you're drinking too much principally so it's just, there are just so many potential reasons for him to have been like that and it's quite hard to manage I mean I, I wasn't there as a doctor as as with John on the things I've done with him I'm there as a, you know part of the support crew not 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 specifically medic as a medic but yeah it's it it's worrying and I do um I'm going to put this bit down to tiredness but I do that last wait when I'm waiting for, you know, when I've done my bit and the next time I'm going to see them is at the end. You know, like Damo says, he has these power sobs. <laughs> now, I have a few tears every time. <laughs> and oh, I'm really, bad. really relieved when they get over the line. So with Damien, when he came wobbling down that ramp to the beach at Robin Hood's Bay, it was a, a massive relief. It was a, a, a monumental effort, absolutely monumental. Yeah, it looked like it, it, it cost him a lot, that run. It looked like he had to put everything on the line for that. It's a he, massive he, congratulations he, to him, I mean. Yeah, yeah, he really did. He, he, he gave it everything and a little bit more. I mean, the, 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 the toll it takes is unbelievable for, for anyone to run that kind of different uh, distance. But yeah, he, as they say, left nothing out there. He just, he, yeah, he ate up the miles even when he had no capacity to think and barely the capacity to run. I'm not quite sure how he did that, but he had wow. some gut, gut problems along the way as well, minor ones, but yeah, so, yeah. He, really had to, 
you had to fight for that one. I mean, whatever the more extreme end of type two fun is, that it sounds like that's very much the territory he'd got himself into. Yeah, um, and I think we made it worse because we were saying to the Pacers, um, do not let him let up. You know, if he'd come this far and, you know, just to get, get him through that last 30 miles, um, well, even actually the last, the last four, we saw him 4.3 miles before the end. And that last little section... You know, we, we, we really said just bully him because now the the, the the essence of this is we just need him to finish as soon as he as soon as he possibly can. And um, yeah, so the Pacers were really giving him some grief. And then Matt Green from Summit Fever Media, who was they were out there, Matt and Eddie and yeah. um, you know, filming. Uh, and Matt and Damien are good friends. So Matt ran with him as well. Tim, one of the guys, you know, long standing Tim Laney, long standing friend of Damo's also ran with him. Um, so I think basically he was irritated to the end. <laughs> That's how he got to the end. Cajole. He was literally annoyed. He, he was, they annoyed, annoyed him along the last few miles. Yeah. Wow. So it was, it was mammoth. It was a massive adventure, that one. Wow, incredible. And uh, we've we've kind of hijacked the John Kelly episode here to talk about Damien Hall. I, I think it's only <laughs> polite now that I take us back maybe another week or so. Because, again, you were at the finish line of another monumental record slash FKT. Well, uh, how was that finish line? Oh, God, there were tears then as well. Yeah, John, obviously there was a big backstory to, to that, that um, the year before... Uh, John had run the Pennine Way and broken the record. Sorry, my dog's barking. I'm sorry if you can hear. That's <laughs> nah, okay. Um, yeah, they, they'd uh, he'd run the uh, broken the Pennine Way record again. That Mike Hartley's again, just superb bloke. Um, yeah, he'd broken that record, and then a week later, Damien had taken it off him. And there was a you know they're friends, but also obviously in that context, rivals. And and there'd been a. You know that was a big experience and a big a big kind of backstory. And John was coming back to have a go at uh, taking that record back. And that was um, we. I mean, we saw some similar things with John. You know, this confusion. I think very much sleep de- deprivation related for him. Um, but again, it was really, really emotional. You know, we watched him give absolutely everything as well. The, the last two, these last two runs, the Damien's and John's, uh, they just had nothing left in the tank at the end of it. They came in with every ounce of their reserve used up, and it was fascinating, inspiring, and worrying to watch. Yeah, yeah, that that pretty much sums up watching ultra running in general, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, so how has this happened, Dr. Nikki Ligo? Why, well, how has it happened that you are now the uh, go-to crew for record-breaking endurance events? What? Mate, it's because I work part-time. I'm available. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. That's the end of that interview then. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bye. <laughs> yeah, so I, I um, it's the Pennine Way, it's kind of Damien's fault, really. The Pennine Way was a, I knew about the Pennine Way because my dad had done it. Um, I remember just after I'd learned to drive, driving him to Edale to go off and do the Pennine Way and um, hearing his stories about doing that kind of, you know, wild camping his way up up to Kirk Yetim. And so and I'd, my family and I had started doing some, fundraising for a charity called uh, Duchenne Muscular, it was for a charity called Duchenne UK, um, which raises money for research to, to try and find a, a treatment and a cure for a thing called Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy. And I was looking for a challenge that I could do that, you know, that I would genuinely find incredibly difficult. And the two things that I, I felt that I'd find very difficult were be, moving a long distance um, in remote, remote-ish places and being on my own um, for long periods of time in in those kind of situations, I wasn't, you know, I didn't grow up running and and you know, I did walking in the hills with my parents, but um, yeah. So I, so I just I decided to do the Pennine Way, and I and I did it and made a massive fuss about it to raise money. And um, I used Damien's guidebook and I tweeted about it, like wrote a little blog. And he read the blog and he got in touch. And when we were having this conversation just about the Pennine Way, 
he mentioned the spine and I've never heard of the spine race um, before, which of course is, you know, run along the Pennine way yeah. every winter. Well, actually every winter and summer. But so I, 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 that was my first ever dot watching. I, I, after he told me about it, I dot watched uh, the, the race and literally did not sleep. I literally, it was just, I, I was, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't put my phone down. I was just waking up. It was not unlike when I'm working on these things now, just constantly checking the dot. And, um, and yeah, applied to go and volunteer on the, the race the following year and have spent the last few years just kind of leapfrogging the front runners up, up the course. Um, in fact, with your very good company as well. We kind of go up together, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, this is it. This is how me and you have ended up sort of in contact with each other is crazy days flying yeah. up the course of the Pennine Way trying to keep ahead of the front runners. Yes, um, so like do insane, you know, stretch the field out because we start with about, you know, 10 under our belt, don't we, runners, because they're all bunched up. And then by the time we get to Burness, there's usually one and, and then we have to move on because the others are, yeah, so that's so that's how... That's how I get to know people like, that's how I got to know John, yeah. uh, following him him up on the, the, the year that he ran it and, and smashed it and won. And he then sent out a, an email, I think it was, saying, you know, I'm going to do this. Do you want to, you know, how would you feel about coming along? So I did his road support on his first attempt last year, um, which was crazy, crazy, just a crazy, <laughs> crazy adventure. Um, and again, that one was harrowing as well because you, I'm sure quite a lot of people know that he had horrific gut problems. Yeah, absolutely. We, we've you're okay to talk about that in the John Kelly interview. Me and him talk about that a little bit, yeah. and he he expresses quite a lot of gratitude about the fact that you know you've you've kind of helped guide him through that to an extent. Yeah, well, he, he I mean, he, it, I, I learned quite a lot actually through that. I didn't, I don't think I realised how um, prevalent gut damage is and and bleeding is in people who run these kind of distances. It doesn't actually need to be as insane as the Penang way. It can happen in a lot uh, shorter distances, but um, I knew it happened. I just didn't know how common it was. Uh, So I I learned a lot, but yeah, he's, he has, he's changed his diet a a little bit for during, during the events um, and used some medication just to help suppress um, stomach acid production because you, the damage you get into in, inside your gut because of the running that you're doing can end up um, just makes you more, you know, acid is more likely to, to cause more damage than it usually would. So, yeah, he's had, um, it seems to have been really successful. I mean, he was literally chucking the burgers down uh, last week. Um, it was, Excellent. I felt like a, you know, I, yeah, I was proud of him. Every burger that went down, <laughs> I was proud go, of him. Go on, John. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Have yeah, another I'm pot of like, noodle. Hearing more for the burger, every bite of the burger than every step of the run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, um, yeah, so it, it, it was, that's how I got into it all really was so via the spine and then, and then John, um, John inviting me along to help for that and, and then I sort of, Damien invited me along to the, actually I just, so reading his book, I just, um, Damien said to me, yeah, come out. I've got, I've got um, Tim and Mark crewing for me, who is, you know, again, longstanding, Mark Townsend and Tim Laney. Um, he said, but come out. And, and I thought he meant come out, you know, and help. It turned out when I read his book that he thought I was going to pop out at somewhere in the Peak District. I rocked up at Kirk Yetham, <laughs> but he said, he said it was a, su- a surprise, but a welcome one. And he then actively asked me back to come and do this one so it must have worked out all right <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah so so that that was my, my that was my route into it really and um it's been a it's been a journey <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And look, obviously, they're the guys that are putting the miles through their legs and everything. But I, having worked alongside you on the spine, we're covering really big distances and you've, you've got to be in the right place at the right time. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, it's long hours and you are concentrating hard for a long time. It, it takes a lot out of you. I, do you get a lot of sleep during these attempts? Like, No. I mean, I, to, I mean if I go back to... Um, well, so on the spine and on John's run last year, initially when I first started on the spine, I was kind of going up 
pretty much on my own um, the very first year. You know, there weren't it, it, the numbers of volunteers has grown now, but. Um, so my first spine, I got uh, next to no sleep. I was working on that for 10 or 11 days and I can't have averaged many more than that in hours of sleep. With John uh, on his Pennine way, I can't remember how much sleep he got last year, but I know I didn't get as much as he did at all. I had some help for part of that from Sharon Dyson, another one of the spine um, yeah. people who was absolutely amazing. but. I had, you know, decent stretches while I was on my own for it. And so, yeah, no, I didn't sleep then. But obviously, if you've got a bit more, like there were three of us with Damien, so you can get a little bit more. But it's still a matter of, you know, a couple of hours across an event, nothing more than that. So you do come home feeling like you've just done a week of days and nights and days and nights, you know, just ongoing. It's, it's tiring. And you do, I mean, like you say, it's important that you're there when the runners are there. That is literally your one job. Be there, be awake. You know, and, and just be able to, I don't know, like think and make decisions that are, are really knackered, uh, sleep deprived, probably slightly calorie deficient runner might need you to make because they can't make them. And just looking out and, yeah, making sure that they've got food and drinks and that sort of thing. It's not rocket science, but it is important. Well, I, I mean, having worked alongside you on the spine, Nick, I don't think I've seen anyone push put as much of themselves as much of their energy into caring about other people uh, it's, uh, I, it doesn't surprise me at all that you manage to be there and make the right decisions for them as they go along That's very I, easy I, to say. thank you no no it's true if if i was anywhere near fit enough to do something like that i'd call you as well <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've had quite a few messages actually from people saying oh i'm um I'm like, I've really got to do some actual work. I need to turn up at the hospital because I've used annual leave for these. But yeah, but it's, I actually, I think it's a, I feel quite privileged to have that trust from, from, from somebody, you know, these are, it doesn't matter whether you're the back of the pack in the spine or running the coast to coast or running the Pennine way and, and, you know, breaking records, the end goal of, 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 you know, like achieving what you want to achieve is equally important to all of those people in all of those situations. And, and I think being trusted to look after someone doing something like that is actually, a, it's actually a, a privilege. It's a massive compliment. So yeah. I feel, yeah. feel lucky. Um, and just how much planning actually goes into one of these FKTs? Because I, I imagine it. Oh, sorry, I've said FKT again. For anyone listening that's in the record camp, <laughs> You're I'll stick to wait. record. I'm sorry. Um, but, <laughs> uh, you know, let's say for the Pennine Way, for John Kelly's attempt, how, how much planning goes into that? Cause it, it must be like a military operation. So certainly for John, yeah. I mean, so it's the runner themselves that does the vast majority, obviously. Um, and John, John's a big numbers man. You know, he's a data yeah. scientist. And he, um, yeah, he has spreadsheets. <laughs> he has lots of spreadsheets. And they are brilliant. They're really helpful. And it is planned. You know, he... He know. I mean, I don't. I don't know whether he actually on the ground recce's every single mile of everything he's going to run. But I know that he he does do some of his. Or I gather he does do some of his sort of recceing, you know, at his desk, looking just from a numbers perspective. But he he does plan everything with military pre precision, and you know, you know, you know exactly. Obviously, you need to know things like when paces are turning up. That's the other thing that you know, as well as throwing food and drink at people. You know, we have to make sure because you can never fully predict where somebody's going to be at any time. They mm. may be ahead, they may be behind, they may be bang on, you don't know. So just keeping in touch with paces and making sure people are there where they need to be, that making sure that, you know, if somebody has to drop out because they're not well, that they're replaced, there's all that sort of thing as well. But it's all planned meticulously beforehand. We know who's going to be doing the carrying of the kit. We know who's navigating. We have to make sure that we've arranged the exact spot, which might be in a gateway to a field where they're going to turn up um calories john john is very um specific about his calorie intake and you know had a very much so want two to three hundred calories per hour and 20 percent of it to be non-carbs and you know everything was planned and, and in fact i've got a sheet um for this last pennine way that he just did where every single i don't know if you saw the big trays of 
snacks that he had. But I mean, it yeah, was it was making like me hungry. Child's paradise. <laughs> 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 There's loads, but he's, he's written a list, and it's all like you know, whatever. Twelve jelly babies are this many calories. One fig roll is this many calories, so that we wow. can just tot it up. And I, and we do, I do try and be precise about that and then monitoring when they come into a stop what's been left over same with Damien actually now that wasn't the same on the pen I'm with him but yeah same sort of thing just being able to like I can say just from this last one how many calories per hour evened out across the whole thing he actually consumed and I think that's actually quite helpful for the runner and for the coach um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, so in that respect, it's it's planned with military precision. The, the, the runner has to do an enormous amount of legwork and communicating beforehand. And then, of course, you get out there and the vast majority of it all goes to pot because nothing, the only thing you can absolutely guarantee is that it will not go according to plan in entirety. So you need to have some flexibility. And I do my own little, I do my own little tables for these things. So I take the information that's re- relevant for me and my role and I put it in a format, a nice little coloured table that I can, at a glance when I'm tired, know. And that means when we get to a section, particularly if it's a trail, I don't know. So the Pennine Way, I know. And if we get to a section where there's a big climb coming up, I will automatically get someone's poles for them. But the coast to coast, I don't know a lot of that route. So you know, having it written down or a reminder, this next section, it's going to turn dark while he's there, give him the head torch, those sorts of things. So, yeah, it's, that's a very long-winded way of saying it, it's really planned. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for, just a, a bit of a window into the process behind these these attempts. Now, well, thanks very much, Nikki. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, one thing I'm going to ask you before we go, though, is you mentioned the Duchenne charity there. Um, where should I send people if they want to support your charity? So there's, um, there's actually, you can just, I think, probably just Google the name Duchenne, D-U-C-H-E-N-N-E, um, which is the name of this uh, muscle wasting condition, and, and the name LIGO, and, and it should bring up, apart from a whole load of, you know, dross and a whole load of horrendous pictures, it should bring, it should bring up our link as well. Um, but it's really, I'll get it's it off really, you as well and make sure it's in the description of the show too. That'd be brilliant. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really, really important charity to us. We've got a friend who whose little boy was diagnosed with it, and this is a condition where, uh, without going into all the detail of it, it children experience muscle wasting and, they end up, uh, you know, they have a normal childhood in the early years, but then end up wheelchair bound because they lose the use of their legs by sort of kind of tw- age 12. Um, then slowly use, lose the use of their upper limbs. And um, and then eventually, because the heart is a muscle and the, the muscles are breathing, you know, they're, they're all affected as well. And at the moment, it's 100%. Uh, terminal so uh, you know nobody survives it and they have much more, you know significantly shortened lifespan but there is some genuine hope particularly through genetic um, therapies and um, that that we could we could change that and we could change that for the the, the, the children who are living with it now so um, you know it's a relatively hopeful plea for help for that charity um, and we'll keep my kids do a long distance walk um, when they're 10 willingly no it is willingly they do it willingly on the promise of chocolate and my my youngest one was 10 last year but because of the pandemic couldn't do it so hopefully at some point this year he'll go out and do his his long distance sort of around about 100 mile um walk wow uh so i'll be i'll be shouting a lot about that then so i'll, I'll bore people silly with it then <laughs> no i look forward to it uh, oh and also on behalf of all the dot watchers out there thank you very much for providing a sort of twitter commentary of these uh, record-breaking runs as they go along as well uh, they have been a source of much entertainment to me over the last couple of weeks and i appreciate that oh, i'm really pleased that's not always easy to do and um, no, i bet you've got a lot on your plate <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah but it's but i i know what it's like dot watching and i know the difference that seeing a picture Particularly, I don't know if you saw the pictures of John at, at Snake Pass. Like he was, it was just awful. And, and the pictures of when he had his gut problems. A picture speaks volumes, doesn't it? And yeah, um, I think yeah, I know why I appreciate it when I see pictures coming out of these sorts of things when I'm not at them. So, but I'm glad, yeah. I'm glad you enjoyed them. 
Well, uh, thanks very, for very much for, in that sense, and in appearing on the podcast today, giving us a window behind the scenes of these these record breaking runs. It's greatly appreciated. And uh, my pleasure. I'm gonna I'm gonna release you now, Nikki, so you can get some rest. Okay. Thanks very much. Take care, Will. I'll see you on the spine. Fantastic. I'll see you soon. See you later.